book of 1 Peter. Uh, it will be today and then uh, next Sunday we should be finishing up our, our look through 1 Peter. Peter's been addressing this issue of suffering, uh, what it means to suffer for following Christ, and seeking to encourage and give instruction to a group of believers who at this time of history are facing severe persecution, specifically from the Roman, Roman government, uh, the hands of the Emperor Nero, and trying to help them understand what does it mean to find joy, to find peace, to find hope in the middle of the suffering, and how do we continue to be faithful to Christ in the midst of living in this hardship. And as he begins to draw this letter to a close, uh, gives uh, in this passage, starting in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, uh, I think two pieces of advice two pieces of encouragement, not only for those who are facing suffering, but just for all of us. Because none of us can take the stuff that we go through and say, ah, oh, we can compete with first century Christians who are being beheaded for their faith. But all of us in our own ways face trials and hardships and difficulties and struggles. And I found that what Peter's informing these believers about is applicable to our lives as well. And we see that as well here in chapter 4. The first thing he points out starting in verse 12 is finding joy in the eternal. Finding joy in the eternal. It says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. And I love that it begins this verse, this verse with the word beloved. Beloved. It's not the first time that Peter uses it, but again, he's been talking to these believers about here's how we find hope in the middle of our suffering, in the middle of our pain. Here's what it means to live faithfully for Christ in the midst of persecution and trials. But then he comes back to this concept of beloved. Beloved. Literally, one who is esteemed. One who is worthy of love. Now, I don't know how that sits with you. Because there, there's this dissonance within my own soul as I think about that. That Peter would address believers and address us as beloved, again, literally addressing each one of us as esteemed and worthy of love. I don't feel worthy of love. Not God's love. I'm not worthy of his love. And we've kind of made this a little side rant here. We've kind of made this a a badge of honor of saying, I'm a miserable, filthy, terrible wretch of a sinner just saved by God's grace. Yeah. But as you look through the New Testament letters, there are never greetings to the New Testament churches saying, greetings, you wretched, miserable sinners who happen to be recipients of God's grace. Just beloved. Beloved. The love and grace of God change everything. The love and grace of God define how we are viewed in the sight of God. And God doesn't look at us and say, you filthy, wretched, terrible sinners. He says, I see you as covered in the blood of Christ, as righteous, as holy, as saints, as beloved. All of these New Testament terms for who we are in Christ. And I find it fascinating that here in verse 12, Peter uses this word beloved to refer to believers because I think this speaks to the heart of what they might be feeling in the midst of difficulty. Remember, especially for any Jewish people who are in the audience hearing Peter's letter, they are still coming out of an old covenant lifestyle. An old covenant lifestyle where if you're obedient to God, then everything's going to go well in your life. But if you disobey God, things will go horribly in your life. And so here they are now living this new life in Christ, and things aren't going well in their lives. They're suffering. They're facing hardship. They're facing persecutions. They're, they're hiding. They're, they're trying to seek cover and just make it from day to day. And so what would be the natural inclination of their minds? God's angry with me. Peter's like, no. Christ changed everything. Christ fulfilled that law that you think you're still under. And now because of Christ, you are righteous, holy, beloved, and loved by God. And it also brings up this question that we wrestle with. 
Maybe you are praying and crying out to God for a healing, for something in your life, for something for a loved one's life. And you hear reports of God healing, kind of say the quiet part out loud, some silly things, but your serious thing is being ignored? I mean, you'd say, well, I stubbed my toe, but just quickly, God just made it feel better. But why, when we were praying for my mom's life, she died? Why does a little toe get priority over a life? It can make you feel like, well, God clearly loves them because they get their little toe feeling better, but he must not love me as much because something significant like this gets ignored. But again, to all of us, regardless of how we perceive what God is or is not doing in our lives, his word to us is you are beloved in the sight of God. This comes up in John chapter 9. There's a man who's born blind, and Jesus is asked the question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's old covenant mentality. He's born blind. It's somebody's fault. I went to a church for years. It was a great church and experienced the mighty work of God, but there was this little thread that was woven underneath the surface. Like, if you sniffed in church, it was like, he's got to confess something. They're like, well, well, Jesus, clearly somebody, this is God's punishment for somebody. Why was he born this way? And Jesus' answer to who sinned, him or his parents, was neither. It has nothing to do with that. It's just about my glory. So he says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Jesus says, in this world, you are going to struggle. In this world, there's going to be struggles. There's going to be hardships because we face a very simple reality. We live in a fallen world. And living in a fallen world means that we're going to be surrounded by people who don't always act perfectly. We live in bodies that don't function perfectly. Things go wrong. People get sick. People do mean things. And it's not because God is angry or punishing. It's because we simply live in a broken world, awaiting the day when Jesus will make all things right. But again, sometimes we come back to that idea that it's, It's unloving. It's a proof that God doesn't love me that I'm going through these difficulties. Years ago, there was a movie called The Truman Show. And I'm not saying watch it or don't watch it. I I remember being, I don't remember a lot of profanity or anything. It was relatively clean. But the concept of the show is that the main character, Truman, is just living his life in this perfect little town. He's got an adoring wife, a great job. Everybody loves him. Everything's going great. Until he begins to notice things are a little peculiar. Things don't seem to be lining up. Strange things are happening. And he discovers that his entire life is a reality TV show. That he is living in a massive studio. And everybody in his life are actors. His wife, his co-workers, his friends, they're all actors. And he is the star of this reality show. And the climax of the movie, it's been out long enough, but if it's spoiler warning, just he's faced with this choice, knowing that he's living a fake life. He can either, he finds the exit to the studio, walk out of the studio and just go live however you want, or stay in the studio and live this perfect protected life. And the director is imploring him, you walk out those doors and we can't protect you. In the show, We can make sure nothing bad happens to you. You walk out there, we can't guarantee that. And of course, by this point in the movie, everybody who's rooting for Truman is like, walk out the door. The right thing to do to truly love this person is let them be free, which includes he's going to suffer. There's going to be heartaches. There's going to be pain. 
we have this idea that God should just put this protective bubble around us like we're living in the Truman Show rather than allowing us in love to be free people, which in that means we might get hurt. I mean, as a parent whose kids are now flying the coop, I want them to stay in the house. I can protect them in the house. I can oversee them in the house. When they start living away from the house, I can't monitor their lives. But we've seen the stories randomly appear on the news of parents who keep their kids locked up in cages, and we're like, that's not loving. God calls us beloved. And with that belovedness comes the reality that even when things aren't going well, even when we suffer, it's not because God doesn't love us. But there's something bigger to look at. He goes on in verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Eugene Peters, the message, Peterson's message says, Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you are in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. And this echoes what Paul says in Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul saying, yes, things are bad now. Things are suffering now. Things are miserable now. But it doesn't compare to what awaits us in eternity. That this life is just a little piece of the scope of eternity. And so he says, just look at the bigger picture. Because he goes on a few verses later to say, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So what Paul's saying here is Christ suffered. Christ's sufferings were for a bigger story, our salvation. And Paul's saying, we may suffer and go through difficulties in this life, but it's just a little slice of a bigger story that we're a part of, a bigger story in which we're being made to resemble more and more the likeness of Christ so that one day Jesus can be glorified in all things. That's the big story, and the sufferings and the struggles and the hardships are just this little dot on the timeline of eternity. And so verse 14, it says, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. And as everybody looks into this, they, they don't see the three, they see four. And they're not being burned up. Whatever the hardship, Whatever the suffering, Christ is present with you in it. He has not abandoned you. Sometimes we feel that. Our feelings lie to us all the time because, again, going back to the earlier point that if I'm beloved, then where is he? He's there. We may not see it or sense it or experience it, but it doesn't change that he's there. There are times when maybe the kids would be playing with friends when they're little and they, they think they're just, oh, we're out, we got our freedom, we're out doing our thing, but not knowing that mom or dad is actually there, they just don't know it, keeping a watchful eye. Whether or not we experience God with us in the fires does not mean he's not there because we are his beloved the reality that Peter is instilling in his audience is Jesus loves you, Jesus is with you, and Jesus will make sense of this. Not today, not tomorrow, but everything will make sense when we finally get to see the bigger picture. Or the other path we can choose is I'm unloved, I'm alone, and there's no purpose for this pain. Those are the two options. 
And the hope of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is the first one is the truth. that You are loved. That Jesus is, in fact, with you. And one day he'll make this all make sense. That's finding joy in the eternal. The second thing Peter points out is calling them continuing to do good. Continuing to do good. Starting at verse 15. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. If I were to do a paraphrase in modern language, my interpretation of verse 15 is, but don't be a jerk. Don't be hated because you're a jerk. You might be hated because of Christ. You might go through sufferings because you follow Jesus. Fine, we, we glory in that and we find comfort in that, but don't suffer just because you're a jerk. It's interesting as he says there, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. The word meddler there means busybody. Somebody who's trying to control everybody else's business. And he, he, you know, starting with murder, yeah, of course, you know, don't, don't be hated like a murderer. But he's like, also don't be hated like somebody who's just trying to control everybody else's business. Suffer for Christ, sure. But don't suffer because you're just driving everybody else crazy. Yet, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Again, suffering for being a Christian or suffering for just being stubborn or bullheaded. Yeah, I heard a, a message that talked about, it was at district conference, the comparison of Jeremiah and Jonah, both prophets of God, both sent to deliver messages from God. Jonah, we know, wanted no part of this. Jonah was called to go preach the message of God to the people of Nineveh. He even tried to go the opposite direction. God forced him to go to Nineveh, and because he knew he had no way out of this, he's basically like, you're meanies and God's going to judge you. And I can't wait to watch it. In fact, he goes up on the side of a hill, sits and waits to watch the action. That's how much he hated the people of Nineveh. And when God sees the people of Nineveh repent and he shows them kindness, what does Jonah do? He flips out. He's like, God, just kill me. If you're going to be this kind, just kill me. And then there's Jeremiah, whose nickname is the weeping prophet. Who delivers God's message, but he's known for the heartbreaking agony he has for the people of God. If I'm given the choice of what, whose footsteps I'm going to go in, I, I want to err on the side of Jeremiah to weep and to be heartbroken to suffer for that path of Christ and not, I mean, can you imagine the people of Nineveh? Jonah comes in, just kind of spews his message and then walks out. Like, what's up with him? I'd rather err on the side of Jeremiah. But verse 19, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. To entrust, literally to commit to the charge of another. When the kids were little, we were very picky about who we had as babysitters. It's kind of a big deal. I mean, these are the most precious things in our lives. We don't just hand them over to anybody. We want to make sure they're people that we can trust. We'll never trust those other people as much as we trust ourselves to watch them. But who's deserving of that trust? Who's going to take as, as good of care of them as we could possibly imagine? This is the same sense of entrust. Peter is saying, take your life, all of the good, all of the bad, all of the ugly, all the sufferings, all the pain, all the trials, all the heartaches, and entrust it into the care of God who calls you beloved. And trust him to know that, God, I don't understand anything you're doing, 
You say, well, I would never say that to God. Psalms are filled with that. (laughs) Psalms are filled with David and others saying, God, what's your problem? Where are you? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Peter says, take all of your life and trust it to the hands of God. Trust that he knows what he's doing. Trust that somehow in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this suffering, in the midst of this hardship that you are enduring, somehow he's going to take this and make this a part of his good story. That he's going to use this to bring glory to Christ and use this to enable your ability to extend the kingdom of God. But notice what he says, not only entrust your sufferings and your cares and your life to the hands of your faithful creator, but do it while you're doing good. Coming back to the point that he's touched on at other points so far in the letter. Don't be a follower of Jesus who's like, okay, I'm going to trust all of this nightmare that I'm living to God, but if you don't mind, I'm going to go hide because I don't want to be put to death for following Jesus. Saying, Entrusting your life to God also means you entrust your life to God. To say, I I have a life to live for the glory of Jesus, and I can't do that if I'm just hiding. I have to put myself in harm's way. I have to step out to the marketplace where a Roman soldier might be there or somebody might turn me in, but that's where the work of the kingdom is done, so I need to be about my father's business even though it might get me into worse trouble. If you remember the the very concept of Christian, how we so proudly identify ourselves as Christians, that title was originally an insult. They were first called Christians in Antioch. It wasn't a compliment. It was basically, you're just a bunch of little Christ walking around. You're a bunch of little Jesuses walking around. You're annoying. Little Christ. Little Jesuses running all over the place. Look at Jesus. He was being actively pursued by the religious leaders but he kept his focus on the work that his father had sent him to do. We're called to follow in his steps. That's why Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And sometimes we just, it's such a nice phrase, and take up your cross. And taking up your cross in a modern equivalent is take up your electric chair, take up your lethal injection and follow me. It's your instrument of death. Pick it up and follow me. Lay down your life to live the life, to to do the work that he has sent us here to do. Because it's so easy. As we look at everything happening in the world and the chaos in the world and the chaos just of our own lives to say, you know what? I'm just going to curl up in my bed and just wait for the day that that I see Jesus face to face. I'm just zeroed on that day and nothing else matters. That could very easily have been Peter's audience's reaction. You know what? We're tapping out. We're just going to hunker down, wait for Jesus to come, and just stop this nonsense. Peter says, entrust your life to your creator while you're doing good, while you're doing the work that Jesus has called you to do. To not run away from the chaos of society, but to step into it with the good news of Jesus which means pulling ourselves back to say, my life is part of a bigger story, the bigger story of the gospel of Jesus, the work of the kingdom, the glory of Christ. And yes, while I live my short time in this world, it's not going to be a cakewalk. Little kids, when they watch Barney, there's a song that Barney sings of just lemon drops and gumdrops and just all the candy and milkshakes falling out of the sky. and That's the kind of life we want to live. Just I'm just going to live my life and just candy is going to fall everywhere and there's going to be roses all around me and everything's going to be wonderful. Jesus said the opposite. It's like, in this world, you're going to have trouble. In this world, it's not going to be lollipops that drop on you. It's going to be an artichoke. 
It's going to be a mushroom or other nasty things. In this world, we're going to have trouble. Peter says, entrust your life to your creator. Do the work of the kingdom anyway. And remember that you are beloved and your life is just a part of a bigger story that God is telling in the world. Let's pray.